Uh, so my name is Alexander Hirfitz and uh, I'm a senior principal scientist in the, in the drug discovery company called Evotech. It's quite a multi-international company that provides drug services uh, for, the, for dr drug discovery services different uh, big pharma companies. Evotech is quite a big company itself with almost 2,000 people working for it. And I'm working as a computational chemist for almost, uh, I think, uh, 16 years. And the subject of my talk today will be introduction to computational aided drug design and actually actually using computers in the discovery of new compound, of new uh, medicines. So, and uh, I would like to, to say thank you very much for, the, for uh, this opportunity to speak with you guys before you today. It's not my first time that I'm doing it, and it's always a pleasure. And this is the first time that we're doing it in such a, a remote online way. And hopefully, maybe next year we'll, we'll see we'll see all of you face to face. And um, okay, so what is actually more than uh, more than compared to all the uh, approach in the old approach? Uh, it was mainly done by uh, done by medicine. Who were uh, who were uh, searching for new compounds? So they were the certain compounds was uh, sometimes it was done by mistake or was done by some experiments that I will show. And there was a few com first compound was found that actually doing something in our body, and then there was developing of this compound by chemists who will guess where they should make uh, changes and to make this compound better in, in different parameters and the way it's, fun, it's, it's a treatment way, it's other parameters, uh, side effect parameters, and, but it was mainly done uh, by guessing. It was sometimes a rational guess by based on some data, but it was guess. It took a, while, a lot of time because it's required lots of try and error methods and lots of uh, uh, attempts until the, the, the desired compound was found. Uh, and on, on compared to modern drug discovery, modern drug discovery is done by the fact that we have, it's like a GPS in the car where, where you, you know where you want to go, okay? You are, you are guided and you guided by the uh, ability of the computers to analyze the data, to, to, to build hypotheses to help us in many, many ways. And then by doing this to guide us towards our uh, our desired uh, desire targets. And if you do a rational way, computer guided way, then you make it more quick. You, you are uh, focused on only limited number of uh, more rational attempts and it's done quicker and it's done cheaper. So, so in, the, in my presentation, I will talk about this, how it's actually done, what is actually methods that are used, approaches, rationale behind what we are doing today. This is just illustration here. That for instance, this is Evotex. Uh, uh, so as I said, drug discovery requires lots of computers or computer power, and we have actually different sites and all that have the computer centers there and all these computer centers are connected into network. So we have quite a lot of uh, a computer power in Evotech that, that, that allows to do cool stuff. So the agenda of my presentation will be divided to four major topics. First of all, I will we'll talk about the, what is drug discovery process in, in, in overall, then uh, what is actually drug and how we found it. And the next I will introduce us to computer-aided drug design. I will uh, specify a little bit something that my own expertise is computer-aided uh, computer drug design for a G protein couple receptors. I will talk about them. This is a unique target or specific target for, uh, for drugs and uh, which is actually major drug target. And I will talk about them, about them later. And I also will talk about the new directions in drug in in the, in in, the, in computation aided drug design, which is bio ligand, quantum mechanics, protein ligand residence time, role of water molecules in protein ligand binding, and artificial intelligence and machine learning. 
So drug discovery process, you can actually divide it to, to three major, major uh, stages. So first of all is heat identification. Heat identification, we know that there is that, that, uh, there's a macromolecules that are running our bodies. And we know that actually disease are linked to, the, to something in some default in, those, uh, in, the, in the function of those proteins. But sometimes we can't find a link between the, the certain protein in our body in, in the function or misfunction. And, and this is this actually, this, the heat identification is a research that are focusing on finding uh, the link between the macroprotein and, and the disease, okay, that we want to cure. And the moment we know that this protein is responsible for change of reaction that causing sort of certain disease, we, we can target it with, with a small molecule, molecule and by doing it and mediate, mediate its function or fix its function or stop its function or, or make this, this, his, its function more quicker, stronger, better. And this is actually what is called heat identification. The second stage is preclinical R&D is actually finding small molecule mediator, a drug that actually will target this big protein and actually, and by doing it, control its function, okay? And this is what actually we are going to talk today, preclinical R&D, preclinical research and development. Okay, so when we finish already, uh, developing and optimizing our drug. Now we need to explore it and try it if it's really work in, in, in humans. And the uh, first, uh, it's divided to three major stages. The clinical trials, the first stage, we try it, it on healthy volunteers. If this is, this, the, the drug itself is, is, is not toxic, Usually they put the pair, the pair, the volunteer in the middle of the room, surrounded by doctors and then all the machines, and they give him the, the, the pill and he try just to see that nothing happens to him. And this is also done for many, for, for not only for one, but for many of them, for many volunteers that are, the, and the moment we found out that it's not toxic, that it's fine, then we always started to deal with patients and to see if, if, the, if, the, if the pill, if the new drug have the desired effect desired therapeutic effect. So this is done in stage two, and uh, this is done on limited amount of, uh, of patients. Some of them get a real, a real uh, uh, drugs, other get placebo, which is, uh, it's actually not a drug at all. It's something like they think that they have a drug to make so that we don't have any psych psychosomatic effects of uh, you know people that are used to, used to the moment they think that they took drug, they usually believe that it's the drug can cure them and actually they feel better, but it's not as a result of drug, but it's a result of their psycho psychology. And we want to make sure that the drug was better than our psychology. So this is why it's done with the placebo, with the drugs mixed with placebo. So some patients get placebo, some patients get a real drugs. The moment it's done is then after that, it's going to inter international, Multi-international uh, tests is done in different countries for many patients, and and if it's also showing the therapeutic effect, then then it's reaching the market. So it's quite long and expensive and expensive process. So if we can make it a little bit more cheaper, it will be or more, much more cheaper. It will be much better. So today, for instance, in or just to, to just to give a numbers in old days, like in, in the eighties, nineties. The a, a pharmaceutical company on every investment of one dollar, they were getting three dollar back, but today they get eighty pence back, which is as a result of because the drugs are much more uh, sophisticated, they're passing much more, uh, much more tests, much more exploration, much longer clinical trials that make them much more that the research much more uh, expensive. And uh, the, when for this reason, the, the, the need for computers, for doing cheaper with using computers is, 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 is tremendously growing. So what is, what is a drug? What is a drug? I, I you know, just to simplify it. So we, we have a huge body, okay? So how small molecule, drugs, small molecules can have effect on such a big, big body? 
big and sophisticated body. I, I you know, just to, to make it, e just for our imagination, to make it easy to digest this. This is exactly like we have a key and lock in the car. So the car, without this locking key, you, the car is dead, it's just standing. You cannot push it, it's not, cannot move, it cannot do anything. But the moment you put the key inside of this lock and you rotate, suddenly you ignite the car and suddenly the car can move and can take us to all the places that we want to go. But it's actually, it's very much dependent on something very small on, 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 the, on the lock, which is usually in our body is, is a protein, it's some more macromolecule, and even smaller, the key, okay, which is a drug, okay? So drug, so the key can ignite the car or actually doing opposite, it can turn it off. Okay, so this is actually what actually we are after. We are after this key, okay? Ander, guys, can you hear me? You because it's so quiet now, and I want to make sure that I'm not talking to myself. No, we are following. I'm following at least. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Just wanted to make sure we. I am just that there is somebody there <laughs> on the other side. <laughs> okay, so how we can find this miracle miracle key? Okay, how we can find this miracle key? So there is this, okay, so before I telling you how we find this miracle key is actually the, the key, we have three options, okay? We have key that will fit to our, can fit to our lock, yeah, we can, and actually ignite our car with this actually correct fit or incorrect fit. So the, this is in this uh, illustration, it's actually have, it's partially fit, okay? It's don't have this extra, extra teeth here. But actually, this can be such a key that will not even enter into the into our target protein, into our lock. Okay, so how we how we how we proceed with it? Okay, but before I'm telling you how we proceed, I just guys, I don't know. I just talking. Sorry that I'm showing sometimes very basic things, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the backgrounds of you. So I'm just showing for everyone. Okay, so I'm sorry if if it's uh, so, it's so so trivial for for many of you. So actually protein, protein is actually a long chain, a long chain. Actually, this is, this is very appreciated because uh, like my field is fluid mechanics and I'm not very familiar with uh, maybe some special drug terminology. So we are thankful to you for... Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for telling me this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. But I'm very much interested in drug actually design. It uh, looks very nice topic. And uh, if somehow we can link it to other background or skills, that would be cool, so to speak. Absolutely. I'm, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the experience that people have sometimes can be so surprising or their contribution to the field that's coming from these so, so many directions. Sometimes that that looks completely not related, but in the end they actually appear very very related. So, so let's continue. So the proteins actually it's it's a first of all it's kind of a chain, okay? Chain built from building blocks, okay? And we have twenty building blocks, twenty building blocks, which is small, let's say small molecules, okay? It's called twenty amino acids. Each of them is, is amino acids. So we have 20, so now we can combine them in various of combination and lengths. Okay, so this is amino acid one, I'm connected to amino acid two, three, four, and they can be different one. So we have very long, which give us a tremendous uh, possibility of combinations that we have. And this is what is called the primary structure, which is actually long, a long chain, just a chain, okay, here, where we can see this chain. But after the chain is, 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 uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, generated, the amino acids, their side chains, their warheads, which are those, can start to interact with each other and fold into various of different, uh, different uh, uh, structures, folded structures, sorry, oops, folded structures, 
big, big, huge molecules. And those big, huge molecules are the proteins that are actually uh, doing a lot of function in our body. So I just uh, summarized here what actually proteins are doing in our body. They practically do almost everything, okay? So we have, hor sorry, hormones that activate and run certain processes in our body. We have immune system that also combine from the, from the protein that defends against invaders. We have membrane proteins, which we are talk, we'll talk later about this, the transport of essential substances or signals from the outside of the cell into inside of the cell through the, uh, across the, the cell membrane. We have storage proteins that store nutrients, nutri nutrients in our body. We have enzymes, okay? that catalyze different chemical reactions. So they not only catalyze, but without them, the reaction would take 300 years. And with the, with the enzymes, they are, these, these reactions are run in seconds or even less. So practically, they, they generate those interactions, those reactions, sorry. Structure approaching protein. Our body is built from proteins, okay? And we have plasma blood proteins, the transport of essential substances uh, and maintain the blood pressure. They also involve also in immune system. So they are actually transporting uh, uh, our immune system, our antibodies, antigens sometimes to the, through the blood. So we can see how important proteins are and so many functions they are doing in our body. So they are our lock, okay? So they are our lock. And, and the drugs is our, our keys, okay? So we want to control all this system with small molecules, okay? So now only small things is left to find them, okay? So how we find those, uh, those keys to our lock? So the, the, if there is a two ways that it can be done. Experimental, what is called high throughput screening, HTS. You see, you can see there is a robot here. The robot have, for instance, our protein. And you see in those boxes here is different library of different keys. There's a many, many keys there, okay? So it's the robot is putting the protein and see inside and see how much if we get the wanted reaction. If, if the key can bind to our protein, if there is a, some interaction between our key and our protein, okay? We still don't know if this will lead to function numerical. This is done in the process of development. But first, first what we are looking, that the key will fit to our lock, okay? So in this way, we, we can tell the robot is doing, performing millions sometimes minus of, in, of uh, those experiments. So just to calculate it, just to give you the, the figures, every time that the robot put the tube into this uh, box, every experiment costs dollar, for instance. So imagine that we try, we have million attempts. So you will pay million dollars. Very simple, okay? So to find the initial key can be super expensive can be super, super expensive and extremely long, okay? Because even that we have robots, it take time until the robots uh, 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 could finish doing what they should do, okay? And then we get the data, it's take time and it is cost a lot of money. So what we can do instead, what we can do instead, we can actually perform the same thing instead of in reality, we can do it virtu virtually we can perform what is called virtual screening. We can try to meet key with the lock and see if it, and predict if it will work, if there will be contact between them, if they will connect with each other. And then only for the selected number, the top rank uh, keys, we can really explore them. So instead of making million experiments, we can perform 200 experiments. 
okay? Because we have like only 200 keys, we believe that are, have highest chances to, to connect to our protein. So you can see how do we save money here and the speed, okay? This is done very quick. This time done long and expensive. The company is still doing it. The company is still doing it. But virtual screening are entering more and more and replacing this part. So how it's actually done, how we estimate this uh, key lock interaction, how, what, we do, what, need, what we need to do. And, I, and this is actually the second part of my presentation. So what we learned from the first part, we know to do experiment expensive, to do computers cheap, and what we need to find, we need to want to find a winning key to our lock, okay? That's what we are now. So how we're doing it, what is called, this is a new term that enter when the computer started to enter into the drug discovery, it's called drug design. Design, it sound, sounds like something rational, okay? So we put rational into the, into the molecule discovery. So drug design is the inventive process, process of finding new medication. Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to, actually, I was wondering, for example, uh, in the drug design, like uh, this, uh, com or maybe computer programming, these are done in MATLAB, in Python. Of course, my question is very general, but wanted just to get a feeling if these are like, implemented in uh, these uh, open source softwares, commercial ones, or there are just some commercial packages. So for example, as an engineer, as a mechanical engineer, do you think somebody with such a background and uh, uh, if he would be interested to come into this field, it would be kind of like, does it make sense or Yes, so today, in old days, you, it was like you said, MATLAB and all this. We just was doing it. If you needed something, you needed to write the program yourself. But today, you have, you have commercial packages, drug discovery. You know, it's a funny thing because in, in, in engineering, it's also called, called CAD, right? But I think with 1D, no? Computer design, yes, something yes. like that. Yeah. It's yeah. also called CAD, something like that. Yes, so it's funny, yeah. No, today exactly. all this, yeah, everything you've done, you have commercial programs and you have co commercial packages that have give you lots of computational tools that you can use. And uh, it's very iterative. So every every year based on the needs, they, they, they adding more and more, more tools. And they actually, those packages are very cool because they allow you to generate your own tools. You don't need to wait. Sometimes you need something very specific Sometimes you, you need something that don't exist in, in the market yet, and you can just uh, they you can just generate. And uh, I want to just, but I have to say that those those packages are super expensive. Usually they're rarely available to acad academia, unfortunately. And uh, for instance, Evo takes budget for uh, for uh, for licensing annually is one million pounds. So it's a, it's a expensive stuff, but the companies found it very, it's, it's worth investing in because the, the returns are in, in terms of money is huge also. So yes, it, 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 there is a pack, there is a packages that are exist. And uh, yes, we are today, it's, uh, you know, we're using them intensively. It's the same thing that they're, they're in, in, in engineering, nobody already doing any designs with the pens. So, yeah, so just to, uh, I'll, I'll just continue. Uh, so, but you still need a lot of, you know, ex, uh, experiences, computational chemistry is not, there's no, it's nothing done automated. Okay, so you have better tools. Uh, but uh, you still need to be very experienced and uh, have a lot of knowledge how to you not only to know how to use the tools but actually to do a good science it just it's, it's just tools for science it's not replacing the the human so 
Okay, so so this is actually what I spoke with was about design or rational drug design actually with available that actually a actually what computers do is the computers actually took in the data that are exist and trying to find some trends some some uh, build some hypothesis or not only based on data based on 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 chemistry knowledge on biological and our, on, our, on our understanding how the molecules interact with each other there is a rationale behind them there's energetical uh, uh, reasons why the molecules prefer for instance why the the small molecule prefer to go from water into the protein and interact with the protein it's always it, it's always driven it's always driven by energetical energy so if we understand this we can apply this in incorporated in the computational tools and build what is called models or build and models is have a very various you know uh, uh, definitions so models is actually hypothesis okay models that i have hypothesis why my molecules like to bind to certain proteins okay and now i'm using this hypothesis in predicting okay models can be something result on based on the previous data, okay? I'm previous data. So for instance, I, I have making a new molecule and I'm comparing it to all data and see, to all molecules and, and I compare and based on the similarity, I'm actually uh, deciding if this molecule will bind or not to bind or, not, or will not bind. And all these hypotheses called models, tools sometimes called model, models, way to to deal with certain a uh, uh, certain challenge is also called models so the word models have very a very vague but also very large definition okay so to compute computational chemistry methods actually major divided into two two major direction now or actually old school computational chemistry was divide, major divided to two directions. One direction is called structure-based, and other direction called ligand-based. Structure-based direction is the direction that you understand how your small molecule, which you see here, is binding, is interacting with the, with the big protein, okay? With the big with the with big molecule, okay? And when you understand this. You can see actually what, what is actually where it's go, doing good, what are the good interactions, what, and what is this actually missing, and the way where you're changing the molecule. Okay, I just wanted to mention that something that I didn't mention, and I think it's important. The fact that you find a key that can do interact with your protein, it doesn't mean not necessarily that it's actually the final target, the final key. Usually, because those key are not pre-prepared for your specific protein, for your specific, it's, it can enter, but it can do better, okay? You, or it have some properties that need to be improved. Not only interactions are important, it's also important that it will pass the membrane of the cells, that it will uh, not be metabolized in the middle. And if we're dealing for, uh, for uh, making drugs for our brain, it need to pass the, the what is called BBB is brain blood barrier, which is actually the barrier that defend our brain. Okay, so it needs to be able to do so. There's a lot of properties that our molecule uh, need to optimize. So this is actually the, st the step that we, the, the first of all, we need to find the molecule, the key, and then we need to perform optimization. We need to optimize to make it better binder, stronger binder with better properties. So in this way, we use the structure base because we look, our major target is a protein, okay? So we look why, why, why actually this, prot this molecule binds to our protein and what is actually missing, okay? Okay, what is actually missing? Okay, in this way, then we design a new molecule or adding and modifying our molecule in such a way that it will have more interactions. We remove some repulsion or other stuff, okay? So we use homology modeling. Homology modeling also used in virtual screening because that's the way we, we, we estimate how well our molecule uh, fit to our protein. This is one way. 
but sometimes you cannot apply structure base or you can have other methods that can be more efficient like ligand base. The ligand base rely usually on, on the previous knowledge. So you have, for, for instance, you, you look on, you know, not necessarily there's a lot of drug discovery projects or follow-up projects. There's sometimes already some, the keys for this protein was already found previously. But you cannot use it because of intellectual properties or because this molecules have problems in clinics or for other different reasons. But you want to find a new molecule, but you have this information of, of the molecules that were previously found. And you can use this information to, you can use this information to find a new molecules or to optimize your molecules. You actually, one of the things is just overlay them one on top of the other and compare what is actually one half and what is actually other don't have. What is called pharmacophore screening. We have what is called fingerprint similarity cells, different cells. So you can find a molecules that have different structure, but the same properties, okay? The same properties, okay? In this way, you can find a new molecules that have the same properties and hopefully as a result of that, have the same uh, binding and properties against your target. Okay, and this, this is, or you can actually take the original molecule, the original binding, and you start to modify it in such a way that you will clean what is called the intellectual property and make a new molecule for yourself. Sometimes the companies that already have the target in the market, they, and the patent is, is about to expire, they start to modify the molecule in such a way that it will become a new molecule and have extended, uh, extended pattern. Okay, so this way to do this, to take the old, the, the previous knowledge about the ligands, about the small molecules and generate and use this knowledge uh, in, and convert it into the new molecules called ligand base. In many projects, we use both of them. Both, uh, both methods, it's not necessary that we need to select one of them. We, some, we in many cases, we use all the, all the methods that we have. So the, as I said, one of the things that are important is actually to explore how well the, the target and the ligand are fit to each other, okay? So what is done by the program a program that they perform what is called docking, fitting between its computational method that explore the interaction or fitting between the target protein and our key, okay? Here is actually, this is schematic. So the goal of this uh, program is to place the ligand inside of the protein and predict uh, how strong this binding is. Remember guys, if you, I was mentioning the robot that was doing, the robot was doing the same, okay? But experimentally, okay? The robot was putting the protein and ligand together and see how they match, okay? How they interact with each other. Here, what is actually done, it's done by the program, by the computer, okay? The computer doing the same. It's, it's bringing the protein and ligand together. This is the protein and this is small molecule ligand. It's also small molecule is the synonym of the same thing. And actually it sees how well it, how well it fits, how well, how strong the interaction is. So we have usually a, a program still doing, there's a list, uh, there was a question, yes, yes, there is a, a commercial software that are doing it for us. It's actually trying different attempts to try to fit the ligand in different position. So there is a, uh, half of this, what is called search algorithm, which is doing systematic, uh, systematic placement of the ligand inside of what is called protein binding site. We usually know this information from site-directed mutagenesis or from biological uh, activity of this. So we know where is actually, uh, where is the binding site are located. And we put our ligand not everywhere in the protein, but specifically in this binding site. Okay, specifically in this binding site. So we put it in different conformation. We rotate usually the link and usually the protein stay, stay rigid. Sometimes we can apply some flexibility to protein, but mainly it's rigid 
and we just try to feed our ligand inside. And every time, every time, every feed, every placement, we we measure usually some force field that can give us some maybe some information regarding the how strong in terms of energy. We can do empirical, just counting, for instance, number of interactions or some other knowledge base. And this way we combine search placement and scoring to give us the top score docking poses of our ligand side of the protein. Excuse me, may I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, so maybe my question is very simple, uh, but what kind of medium that you're using in your molecular uh, dynamic simulation? As this, I mean, your, your protein bindings, I understand the docking part, but if, I mean, the hemodynamics of the drug, uh, which basically has an effect, but but in your simulation, what kind of medium, or is it in vacuum, or are you simulating this drug binding and docking? The docking, usually, it's not MD simulation. Not MD simulation. It's what is actually, uh, technically, how it's done. You generally take your, league, your small molecule, generate all possible conformation for it. It can be done, you can take into account that it's actually insolvent or you can take into account this is a vacuum, depends. Depends on the situation. And then you actually, because you have a, now your protein on one side and you have a list of, of different conformation for your ligand, you just, you know, just place them and, and, you know, together and see how well they fit, okay? But so the, usually the, the the MD simulation done mainly if you want to uh, explore uh, some dynamic behavior of the of its more sophisticated cases. So some certain dynamic behavior of the ligand and protein together as a result of binding. Then it's, it is done usually with MD simulation. So, and uh, you don't uh, use any- yeah, Sometimes, yeah, go on. Uh, you, uh, I mean, uh, in the simulation. So once you applied this uh, docking, for instance, or yeah. protein binding. So I mean, later on for verification to the large, a large number of the molecules, are you using the coarse grain type simulations, or not just just leave it as a as it is, and then just say that this is the result, so that you can uh, confirm that this is going to happen in reality. I mean, this, I'm talking the, with the large systems. I mean, so just you, you, you do it like a coarse grain and then you we move forward to the continuum models. I mean, it's continuum model, maybe it's not possible, but at least for the- Coarse grain is usually a, well, coarse grain can be used some looking a lot of number of, of residues, yes. So a lot number of, of ligands, yes, it can be done. But I think the computers today is so, so powerful that there is no need for that. So we usually done it uh, for full atom uh, systems. But again, I am, we rarely do MD simulations. We rarely do MD simulation for a couple of reasons. MD simulation take time and, uh, and uh, in industry, they, 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 I will talk about this on this DMT cycle, DMTA cycles. Uh, the, 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 the cycles are very quick. So it's much easier if you want to check hypotheses, certain hypotheses. So uh, when this is, a, you, you just design a new molecule and you check those hypotheses, okay? So the, the, the check of, of the, the, the validation of what, of what you do, or the whole hypothesis that you do is very, very quick because the, the, in the end of the day, you make a small molecule. So your small molecule, if it's not binding, then something wrong in your initial hypothesis, you go back and analyze this. Okay, so that's, that's, very, that's very quick. So you can, you, you know, in, 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 it's very, I know, I know it's not very, maybe not super scientific, but it's super pragmatical way just to design molecules and checking hypothesis. And the, the feedback that you get from your computational work from experiment is very, very, very quick, especially in industry. Okay. Does it answer your question? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, actually, I got the. I mean, uh, the, the idea is to get some insight of your work. Maybe I can apply it to my work. So I, I think you clearly told about uh, how 
you wanted to make a simple model, but I mean, uh, that what represent the molecular level interactions and then force fields. That's nice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, the question from where we are taking broad structure, 3D structure of proteins. So again, we have uh, two methods, okay? We have, uh, there is a, it is solved by crystallography experimentally, okay? Uh, and uh, the information of the, the, all the, the, the coordinates of the, of the proteins, of many proteins are stored, what is called in protein data bank, PDB. And here is the link here. And you have the infer interface. So if you need to find your protein, you write the name here and it gives you your protein. But in many cases, we have, uh, there's a, in spite of the fact that the protein data bank is quite large, large data bank of proteins, there's a lots of proteins there. And in many cases, you do find your protein there. But uh, in many cases, you don't find your protein there. And what you do then? So there is a way to build your, uh, your protein, okay? To build your protein structure. So what you know about your protein structure? You know it's, it's, it's amino acid sequence. Do you guys remember in, the, in one of the first slides? Slide we have a, a chain, okay, of amino acids, okay? So each protein have amino acids, okay? So if you have this sequence of amino acids, you can search against, for instance, protein, you can search for the uh, a protein that have very similar sequence, okay? So you compare, the way to compare proteins is actually comparing their sequ amino acid sequence. So uh, the, assumption, the assumption is, so if the two proteins have very similar amino acid sequence, they have high chances that their folding, that their 3D structure will be also similar, okay? So this is the way to do that. So you take your, your, your uh, you're taking your sequence, you're uploading, for instance, to PDB or you search against PDB is what is do sequence alignment, the way to, 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 to compare. I don't want to go into too much uh, technicality in this, but this is the way sequence similarity. This is the way to compare two sequences. And you, you measure homology, you measure how well, how similar those two Two sequences here. And if, if the percentage is higher, for instance, than 35, 40 percent, you can say that they are quite similar. And actually, what do you actually do then? You replace the, the protein, the, the sorry, amino acids of, of your the pro, of the protein of the template, the protein that have crystal, they have structure, 3D structure, with the sequence, with the residues of your modeling, model. A, a, a protein, okay? In this way, this replacement, copy-paste, in the end, you have your protein. But obviously, there will be some clashes because they, in spite they are similar, but they are not twins, identical twins. It's, it follow usually some optimization. That can be, for usually, it's minimization. It can be light and dissimulation. It can be a different method to optimize this, okay? Usually some energetic wise, usually, usually simple minimization fix this. And usually we perform model validation. Model validation is usually some kind of retrospective, okay? So you, for instance, if you have a list of molecules, of your molecules or your, or your keys, and you know that they have different uh, binding affinities to your protein, and then you dog them into the, your new model protein and the model need to be able to, to rationalize, explain why, the, 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 why where this difference in, in this delta in potency between ligands are coming from. So one, for instance, have 10 interactions and another have seven interactions. And this is why does this seven interaction ligand have lower potency. This is actually, actually the way to, to validate it. Again, proteins is not our final target. Our final target is the ligands, okay? We've, we are producing ligands. This is the drugs. This is why, what we are. And, and those proteins are just a tool. So I less care that actually, I much less care if it's not exactly like in its reality, as long as it's actually explaining my experimental data and helping me 
to design a new molecules that are more potent and have better properties. Okay, again, it's not super scientific, it's pragmatic, scientific, pragmatical way. And uh, this is this. So again, I just to summarize this. So this is the way to do structure based. Structure based method is aimed to understand the interaction between protein and the ligand, and improve those interactions. Okay, and making molecule more stronger, more stronger binding. And to do that, we need to do to have protein that we can do experimentally from PDB, or we can uh, model it using homology modeling. Okay, and then we use docking to fit between them and to understand the interaction. This is a, and a for following by design of new interactions. This is this is the structure based. Ligand based is actually a working differently. Ligand based is actually I'm forgetting about protein for a second. Okay, I'm just taking more molecule. My query. Okay, my query molecule which can be known molecules. And I put it in the library and I see which ligand from my library of, of molecules can fit, can overlay nicely on top of my, of my known ligand, okay? I know that this ligand is strong binders, but I need something new, okay? I, I want to find something new, okay? So I assume that if I, if there is, I found something that overlays nicely on top of it, it will fit, it will, uh, it will probably will have the same, I, I don't know how my, this for instance, imagine that you don't know your protein, you don't know how it look like, but you assume that if two molecules fit overlay nicely on top of the other, and one is known to be a strong binder, then the other will also be a strong binder, okay? So for instance, you have this uh, example here, we have two protein, two ligands that fits to each other, and they have elements, this color, what you see green here is, 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 is a carbon and the color that is usually nitrogen, oxygen, and other, uh, uh, and other uh, uh, atoms like uh, usually fluorine, chlorine, sulfur, and other, uh, yeah. So they, they actually, they, they are forming major interactions and you can see if they are overlay nicely on top of the other. So the elements, the pharmacophore elements, a donor acceptors, aromatic moieties fit to each other, then probably the second molecule will also have ability to bind to our ligand, to our protein. Obviously, it's it's a hypothesis, okay? And but again, we have this we have this advantage. We have this advantage that everything is experimentally validated very quick, and I, I will speak about this in a second. Key to lead. So usually a preclinical R&D is divided to, to two major stages, heat to lead, the, the, the heat is actually what you found from virtual screening. This is the first key, okay? The first key that show that it's ability to bind to our protein. So what you want to do, you want to optim usually the binding is quite weak, okay? Quite weak. And you want to optimize this binding. So to, you, you use the heat to lead stage is actually the first couple of attempts to see if you even manage to improve it. Okay, so you, you usually dock it into your protein, you see how, how well it binds, where, why, why it's not binding stronger, and you suggest some small addition, modifications, alterations, and you see if you manage to improve. Okay, if you manage to improve this, then it's go what is called lead optimization. Lead optimization process is long process is to bring in our chemical series, our, uh, our key, uh, through the iterative steps of design and testing to the clinics, okay? This is what is called lead optimization. And I was speaking about this uh, strong link between computational part, uh, hypothesis part, and experiment. So this is actually working kind of a four stages cycle. So you take your molecule, your key, you design some modification based on your understanding on the way that you look how your protein interact with your ligands. You suggest some modification, you design a new targets for synthesis. Those molecules are made in the library, in the, sorry, in, in the lab. <laughs> and then they are tested 
and the results is analyzed and, and it feed back to your computer models, okay? So in this way, you have this all the time, all the time, you, your, you validate what you do, you up, update your models, you becoming more and more smart, the compute, the, your understanding become more and more better and the molecules are become more and more better. So usually this is what is called DMTA cycles. And this cycle usually in the industry happening for one to two weeks. So every cycle, okay? So obviously in project, you have multiple tests, the cycles like that, you, you, they are, you're doing again and again and again, 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 and until you really reaching what you want to, to reach in the end. So actually I, I am, entered those slides about the coronavirus just, uh, just uh, recently as examples of what actually done in terms of, of coronavirus. Obviously, all of you hear about vaccinations. Vaccination, the purpose of, of vaccination is to prevent coronavirus, prevent coronavirus. But what will happen if people already have coronavirus? What they should do, how we should treat it? And that's what actually where, where I would like to talk uh, with you guys today a little bit, just to mention. So corona history of coronavirus, coronavirus actually was found originally in 1960. So it wasn't, it's not something new. We know about coronavirus quite a long time. There is a four of them, four of them, coronaviruses, four of them, sorry, uh, my mistake, seven of them, which four of them are actually quite harmless and three of them are quite harmful. Okay, so we have coronavirus, the original SARS was reported originally in 2002 in, in, uh, in China and was spread to Asia, Asia, North America and Europe, but it was promptly contained. And uh, then was a MERS in 2012, and now we have SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so we have it quite often now, unfortunately, which COV2 has really caught us by surprise. So severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, that is the, the old full name of this virus, was a, a originated in central China, Hubei province, Yuhan, in 2019, and World Health Organization named this disease coined by this COV2 as coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. That's what we actually familiar with. And what you see here on the right side is the, the, the electron microscope uh, view of uh, COV-2. So why COVID-19 is so dangerous compared to other, uh, for instance, flu? Because this is the way you can see actually how the virus, the, this is the, the COV-2 viral load. This is amount of viruses in our body. Okay, and this is the, the time of the, of the appearance of the symptoms here. So you can see that actually, and all this, for instance, this part here is pre-symptomatic -sy pre state, phase. The fact that we already have the coronavirus, but we are not aware of it. Okay, and this is almost seven days. We are we having coronavirus in huge amount in huge quantities, and we are not aware of this. And this is what makes the COVID nineteen COVID uh, this is so so dangerous. Okay, in addition to all this horrible side effect that it actually can carry with it, but it's interesting as you can see the amount of COVID COVID of the virus in our body is going down, but the, the damage is actually going up. So we always used to, the more symptoms we have, the more virus we have. It's not in, in the case of, of, of COVID-19. Opposite, the, the, to, the peak of the amount of virus that we have in our body is actually when we have very, very mild, mild and moderate uh, symptoms. On the other hand, you have this actually line here that you can see here. This is amount of antibody response to COVID-19. 
So actually the peak of the response actually is coming on the day 14 when we practically don't have virus anymore. So this is, the, this is why we need vaccination, okay? To vaccination actually to fit between the peak of the, of the antibodies will fit to the peak of the virus in our body in the beginning, okay? This is why we need vaccination, okay? This is actually what we learn from this, uh, from this uh, plot. I have a question regarding the time. Guys, I'm already, can I continue? Because I'm actually finished now in terms of times. Guys? I, I, I think that I could, we started at 10 minutes past the hour instead of on the hour. So I think okay. if you were comfortable to finish in 10 minutes, that would fit within an hour presentation. This is being recorded. If people are not able to stay for an additional 10 minutes, then I imagine that they will be able to follow the completion of your talk on the recording. Would that be okay? Absolutely, absolutely. I'll, I'll think I'll talk about this. Uh, I have a lot of slides, but I think stop very soon after the, after the coronavirus. Okay. So, okay, so what you hear, hear, can see here, actually, this is the coronavirus schematic way. This is actually, a, you can see outside the spike glycoprotein. This is the way the glycoprotein, actually, the moment the virus enters into our body, it's aimed to penetrate into this, our cells. It's done uh, via this uh, spikes protein, glycoproteins that are a, uh, mediated by our own uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. In this way, it's entering into the cell. The moment it's entering into the cell, it's using its RNA, it's using a genetic code that are sitting inside of it. It's actually, connect, it's actually using our own ribosome, okay? Uh, the, and it's using our own genetic mechanism, translation mechanism to produce a uh, two what is called polyproteins, two long, long, long proteins. Okay, two long, long proteins, and just so it's have okay, so it's have this RNA. You can see it's RNA, and actually it's produced what is called this two uh, two polyproteins. This is a long, long, long protein, and in the this polyprotein have a two proteins, one is called a uh, PL pro and three SL pro. This is actually scissors, okay? You can, they, they work like a scissors. They disconnected themselves from this long, from this long uh, polyprotein, folded as a result. And actually it's taking this chain, long chain, and actually it's cut it to individual protein. Okay, it's working like a scissors, okay? And now we have 16 different viral proteins in our cell, okay? 16, and those proteins actually are used by the virus to duplicate itself, okay? So it's using the mechanism of our body resources of our cells to generate its own proteins, 16 proteins, and those 16 proteins actually are used to generate a new, a new virus cells. This is how this virus work, okay? So this is, is what is called his serial cell pro. This is one of the scissors. It looks like a lovely heart, but it is not, okay? It's a killing protein, okay? So it's actually the scissors. It's actually the scissor those scissors that actually cutting this long polyprotein generated, trans, tr uh, translated from RNA into the into polyprotein, it's actually it's cutting to individual. So if we will manage to find a key that will block this scissor, okay, again, we need a key, okay, guys, we always need a key. We can turn this off. We can turn off these scissors. We can make this, this, this scissor will not work, okay? And 
this season is so specific, so specific to this polyprotein, there is no really mutations found in this active style. So there is a, you see mutations, a new variant of coronavirus, this is usually happening. This usually happening in spikes, okay? This usually happening in spikes. It's not happening in RNA, okay? The RNA it is solid, okay? And as a result, because RNA is solid, it's always producing the same protein. It's always producing the same protein. And if we will manage to block those proteins, as mainly those scissors, the, the, the virus will not be able to, to cut its polyprotein into the 60 proteins and will not be able to duplicate itself. This is the idea, okay? This is actually, a lot of effort are actually done to achieve this. Okay, what you can see here, it's a model of this substrate. It's like a part of this long protein, okay? It's, it's a part of the long protein, okay? So this uh, Strial 3 Pro is working like an enzyme. Remember, remember guys from the, one of the first slide, enzymes, their job is to catalyze certain processes, to do something. So what this is actually doing, you have this long, pro, long polyprotein, this enzyme is cutting here, okay? It's cutting here. So all this part is falling as a separate protein. And then it's continuous, like a, it's a, like a line, okay? It's like a machine, okay? Like a, like a machine that actually, and this is, is going through it and this is ch -ch 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 cutting it to small proteins until it's forming those 16 proteins, okay? So polyprotein have 11, 11 sides, okay? That are cut by this real pro. So if we manage, so if we manage to generate a small molecule that will actually sit in the protein and will block, will compete with this substrate, with some, this long polyprotein, compete with it, it will slow down or stop the process. So the idea, to somebody look on the substrate, on this polyprotein and thought, well, actually I can convert this to small molecule instead of, you know, searching. I can just, what is called poly, uh, peptidometic. I will mimic this, okay? But it will make it short and small. And this molecule was one of the first who was found. And currently we have uh, molecules, this TG02, Five two to one have fifty three nanomolar. This is very nice molecule, much more uh, drug like molecule that actually can sit in instead of this inside inside of the binding side of three cell pro, and prevent of the uh, and prevent it to work as a scissors. It's actually blocking its activity. This is actually done. As, as a fight against, and okay, and as, as I told you, this, this process is in, 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 in spite of the fact that a lot of companies working on those, it's still a very, very long process of discovery. And until now, none of those compounds reached the clinics, but, uh, but many of the companies are very close to, to achieve this, which, which, is, which is great. I think I'll stop here. I brought you a little bit more information here. So just to give you, uh, this, this is a, just to give you just introduction for this project. This was my project actually. This was against a anti-asthma project, which original compound that came from virtual screening. No, I, I'm not sure it was virtual screening, hydropool screening, yes was compound, this compound here, every, and we looked on the, pro, on the interaction between this protein and as between this kinase, this protein, and this, and this small molecule heat. And we counted that actually a number of interactions is like one, two, three, four, five, only five interaction, and wasn't super uh, potent for 160 nano, nano, nanomolar. And we modified, you can see this molecule, this is actually original molecule, and this is molecule with modification. So it's longer from both sides. Some of the interactions are changed also here. And you can see actually the number of interactions are much, much larger, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
Okay, so double number of interactions and the result will move this compound is much more potent, much more stronger in terms of binding, have much better uh, properties. So what you can see here is typical structure-based drug discovery. Okay, so imagine you don't have a uh, computers that can show you this, that you can understand how they are. Uh, imagine how much, uh, how much changes you, you, you will be able to do. Okay, a huge, huge, you will need to hold a big team of people who will synthesize almost every option possible here. And it will take you a lot of time to do that. But on the other hand, when you, in, in modern drug discovery, when you have the, the you can see this on intera those interactions. You can understand how the ligands are interacting with your protein. You can design smartly, okay? Be additional interactions, okay? You can use the computer to, to tell you if you gain those, if you indeed have those interactions. And lots of things they do that those design are already made by the program. The program itself offering you different things. It's look, the program itself analyzes the binding site and suggests to you automatically which changes you can make, okay? All this is very, very useful and, and very, very efficient. So I think I'll stop here. And uh, thank you very much, guys. Probably I will next year, if I have this opportunity to talk to you, I'll talk about other, uh, also about other stuff that I wanted to talk today. Sorry, it took me much more than I planned. Um, much longer. But I wanted to say thank you so much to, to Andrea for our collaboration. We developed very really cool stuff together. Uh, and uh, thank you to, to Combiomed and the team and Afonso that they invited me and gave me this opportunity. And to all of you guys that you have patience uh, to listen to all this today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Can we put your slides up for people so that they are able to follow along with them with the, the recording? Would that be a possibility? Yeah, of course. Yes, please do. Okay, yes, absolutely. perfect. So I've got a question about that. And I think people are, are starting to, to head off to, um, to various things now. So I wanted to thank Alex very much for his presentation today. Um, unbiased, of course, both in ligands and in the fact that he's a, a good friend and collaborator. And it's really unusual to have academic and industrial collaborations. And so this is a rare and a valuable thing. And we've been able to do an awful lot of very cool stuff with it, particularly as part of Comp Biomed, but outside of that as well. <clears throat> so I guess this is the end of your program for today and you will rejoin back um, for tomorrow morning. So I just want to say thanks to everybody and enjoy the rest of this course. Farewell. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you everybody. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day.